Hello there and welcome to Inside Quantum, the podcast telling the human stories behind the latest developments in quantum technologies. I'm Dr. Ellen Derbyshire and I'll be your host for this episode. In previous episodes, we've talked about quantum communication, machine learning and benchmarking quantum systems, but we haven't yet delved deeply into the area of security of quantum information and the necessary research area of quantum cryptography. It turns out that quantum devices, although challenging to control, have the potential to be much more secure than classical devices, and understanding the fundamental reasons for this are important for securely transferring information. Today's guest works in the field of quantum cryptography, and her research has encompassed topics such as machine learning and quantum foundations. It's a pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Mina Dusty, a Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Hi, Mina, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Ellen. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure to have you here. So before we get into the details of security of quantum information, let's first talk about your journey to this point. Maybe you could tell us a bit about how you got to where you are now and give us a quick summary of your career up until now. Okay, thank you. Um, should I do the long version or short version? <laughs> as broad or narrow as you want. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, I guess um, the long version is that I, um, I had a love for mathematics and physics from a very young age. And um, I think this... Um, this interest is channeled into the love for physics, mostly in high school. Um, and I got interested in big words like string theory and particle <laughs> physics and things like that. Um, and long story short, when I was going to um, uh, pick a major for my undergrad, I was very sure that I'm going to do physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, one of the reasons was that I wanted to understand this mysterious theory called quantum mechanics, <laughs> which talks about the physics of subatomic world and things like that. So um, so yeah, so that, that was the plan kind of like from, from high school. So when I went to undergrad, uh, I, I went to Sharif University of Technology in Iran, uh, which is kind of like the MIT of Iran, so it's the, it's the best technical university in the country. Uh, and I studied physics, and I think I was, I was so much waiting for taking the quantum mechanics course to finally understand what's it about. And when I finally had it, I felt like this is not enough, so I need to, I need to learn more about it. <laughs> yeah. And I think so this 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 was my journey more in, in, in the undergrad. But the thing is that I don't think my plan was to work on quantum computing from the beginning. It was mostly that I wanted to do quantum field theory and particle physics and high energy physics. But then I more tried to learn about what people do in this field on the research side. And further and further I felt like maybe this is not what I want to do or I found like the problem that people are working um, on the research side are not as exciting to me although the big picture of the field is very exciting but the day-to-day -day work and um, the things you have to work on and the kind of math you have to solve mm. is not what I exactly want <laughs> so I tried to um, look for other other areas of physics that I might find exciting. So I tried cosmology, biophysics, lots of different <laughs> things. And uh, I was kind of becoming desperate because I, <laughs> I couldn't find like, um, none of them would really click to me as something I would really like. Um, and uh, what then I thought that maybe I'd give it a go with quantum computing. So we had a good quantum information and computing group in the university. And uh, I thought maybe I'd do my undergrad project in that area. And well, there was a 
professor who with whom I did my undergrad project, Lale Memarzadeh, and I really liked her as well. So I was like, why not? Let's give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> and while I started my undergrad project that summer, there was a conference going on, an international conference on quantum information and quantum computing in Iran. And she uh, suggested to me that I, maybe you should come to this conference and see what people are doing. And because it's a big conference, a lot of international researchers are coming from all over the world. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. So I went to the conference and that's, I think, where everything clicked. And yeah. <laughs> I became so happy. I, I was listening to the talks, not understanding most of it. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, but I, one thing that I, it really resonated with me was that how diverse is the field, and uh, I felt like uh, it's there's a lot of innovations there. So the kind of like questions people are working on. Um, Do you mean and, um, diverse scientifically? <laughs> yeah, diverse yeah. scientifically, and like the kind of like tools and ideas they use in the research mm -hmm. it seems very it's, it seems very um interesting to me and um then i then i was like okay this is what i want to do finally <laughs> and it had lots of quantum as well which i which i loved <laughs> so so it was perfect um, so then I did my master also in the same university, but uh, with Vahid Karimipur, mm -hmm. who is the head of this um, quantum information and computing group in Iran. He's also kind of like the father of quantum information in Iran. He's one of the first person who uh, wow. have worked on this area. Um, so I did my master's there. And um, towards the end of it, I um, I wanted to go abroad for my PhD. So I kind of like decided for that, that I didn't want to uh, continue doing my PhD there. I wanted to go abroad and um, get the experience of uh, working in an international environment and having the chance to collaborate with um, more researchers. Um, so, so that was the plan. I applied for a couple of places. Um, including Professor Elham Kashafi, who <laughs> she became my uh, PhD supervisor. <laughs> and I actually met Elham in Iran before oh, I, I applied to her. Yeah, maybe like a year before that I applied to her or something. She came for a conference, she gave a talk, and she was talking about uh, how we can verify and check uh, these quantum computers uh, when we have them and things like that, which to me sounded really cool at the time. And I was like, oh, this, this is stuff are really interesting. Yeah, so, so I applied um, and, uh, well, she accepted me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember the first um, uh, interview we had together. I also knew that she works on crypt uh, quantum cryptography a lot. Uh, I told her that, look, I'm really also interested in doing quantum cryptography. And she asked me, uh, oh, okay, good. How much cryptography do you know? And I said, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to be honest. <laughs> yes. But I said, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really interested to learn. And yeah. that was another thing that I, I really kind of had a passion for ever since I was a kid, uh, you know, like codes and riddles and things like that. And um, yeah. I always like to know what's it about more in depth, like scientifically. And so, yeah, so she was really one of the people who I really wished that she would accept me as a PhD student, and she did. So <laughs> then I did my PhD with her uh, at the University of Edinburgh, um, uh, which was a really amazing journey. I met lots of uh, people, including yourself. Yes. <laughs> And um, so when I finished my PhD, um, I, uh, I got two uh, different fellowships, one from um, Perimeter Institute and one from um, uh, Quicks in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, so I was really close to go to Perimeter because it was my dream institute again, like from back the day when I was very young. Um, but for some reason, after lots of thinking and thinking and thinking, I decided to go to Maryland. So I accepted the Maryland offer. Um, 
but I actually um, didn't get there. I waited for uh, the visa for a very long time, more than a year, yeah. for a visa that never came. <laughs> and uh, well, I, I, I couldn't uh, actually like join in person. Uh, but while I was waiting, I um, um, I joined as a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. So I worked as a postdoc there till kind of like now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I recently applied for a Chancellor's Fellow position in the University of Edinburgh and I became a Chancellor Fellow. Successful. Uh, officially from a couple of days ago <laughs> yes congratulations <laughs> thank you <laughs> so yeah I think that was the long version <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to delve into there so I have um, a few follow-ups and um, so one you said that you were interested in uh, quantum mechanics from before your undergrad which is interesting because a lot of people don't hear too much about it is there a reason you you knew kind of more or you knew about this area of physics mm-hmm. um so i think it was because as i said i was reading lots of like popular science book i was trying to also read some non-popular science book but it was very hard so i couldn't really like understand them very well but i was trying um but um, I think the reason I got into quantum mechanics was that uh, I was reading about string theory and particle physics. Yeah. And then I realized <laughs> that in order to understand those, first you need to understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> so that 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 became my um, my passion for it. I was like, okay, so this is something I really need to understand. <laughs> and as I said, even when I went to undergrad, when I had the quantum mechanic course, I was like, no, that's not it. I have to, I have to really understand it. Um, so I, I kind of, I actually learned quantum mechanic from Feynman lectures. Um, oh, a great again. way to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think I had a, a very similar journey with particle physics and all the pop science books, definitely. Um, so also maybe for the listeners, they might not know so much about quicks, but as you said, it is in Maryland in the US. And it's so horrible that you had to wait such a long time and still didn't get a visa. Um is this something that you come across a lot and that you know people come across a lot within the field? Yes, I mean, so I think one thing might be that, well, because of the field and the other thing is particularly, I I come across a lot, uh, I think because, well, I'm from Iran and mm-hmm. I have to apply for a visa for almost everywhere and uh, it takes a long time usually. Uh, well, ne- it never took so long, but <laughs> in yeah. this particular case, yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, I think it's a it's a big limitation for researchers because um, uh, it put a big hold on um, you being able to travel for conferences and visits and things like that. Um, Definitely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What can you do? <laughs> Well, yeah, no, but it's a definitely, it's a big, um, it's a huge barrier, especially for researchers who are coming from Iran. And as you said, with Sharif University, I mean, Iran is so uh, kind of, there's so many great students and researchers coming yeah, from that too. So, yeah, it's a real shame. It's, I, it's something that I wish we could change in this podcast conversation, but of course we can't. Um, so also, you mentioned how your interests have always been kind of learning and code breaking and quantum mechanics, as you mentioned. But I also wonder what you think you might be doing if you weren't a quantum cryptographer, because I think that you could be so many different things. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um... I think the answer to this question is not that hard for me, uh, but it's it might be very different from what you expect or what the audience expects. So if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now at the moment, uh, 
was probably a musician <laughs> and I think I almost um I almost went on that road uh, in in high school. I was really close to go to art high school instead of like the the normal high school. But um, then I decided that you no, know, maybe this is something that I'm better at. To, to be fair, it was also a bit of fear of not being uh, maybe like uh, good enough as a um, as a violin player and while like in science it was more more comfortable <laughs> but I, I really love that and I still love that and music is still a big part of my life um, so I think yeah I, I would probably be a musician in a <laughs> alternative life. <laughs> Yes, I was hoping you would say that for the audience. Mina is a very good musician. She writes and plays beautiful music. Um, Thank you. And I think, I mean, it's it's sometimes said also that if you are good at music, then you might also be good at math. So they do go hand in hand, I would say. <laughs> okay, so we've talked a lot about your journey until this point, and... I would love to hear more about your work now. So if I were to summarize your research work in a single phrase, I might very broadly choose quantum cryptography or quantum cryptanalysis. Um, perhaps you can break down for us what these two words mean and the difference between them and talk a bit more about what you're working on specifically. Okay, uh, that's a great question. That's a great way to put it. Um, so yeah let's break it so quantum cryptography i'd say is um the science and art of uh, making <clears throat> uh, systems and schemes um, that have some cryptographic functionality and in order to do that you use um uh, quantum systems or so it, it it can be um only quantum systems or it can be hybrid a combination of classical system or quantum system and mm -hmm. the objective is to design a secure system um so security always doesn't mean um encryption uh which is when you have a message and you hide it uh with a secret key uh, and then then no one can open it or read it, and then somebody else decrypts it, meaning that reads the message. Mm -hmm. um, so that's maybe cryptography um, for most of people when they think about it. Uh, but it's, it's a lot more than that. So there's a lot of other things you can do that they need to be secure. For instance, um, if I don't see you on the Zoom and I want to make sure that I'm talking to you, there are cryptographic methods that can ensure that, and that's called entity authentication, for instance. Oh. Um, so, so there's a lot of functionality, but the, the goal is to make these uh, secure schemes in a way that we can trust them and we can achieve what we want to do. And quantum cryptography is using the laws of physics in particular quantum mechanics and quantum systems to make that happen. I see. So that's quantum cryptography, the way I define it. <laughs> I think that's a um, very good summary. <laughs> thank you. So quantum cryptanalysis, on the other hand, is analyzing the security of these quantum or quantum classical systems. Uh, but as you can imagine, for analyzing security, uh, we need to understand how we can break the systems. So as much as quantum cryptography is about um, designing system or making systems secure, quantum cryptanalysis would be about breaking systems. So you would have to think yourself as a hacker and try to use uh, quantum devices and classical algorithms, everything you have, to break the systems, because when you break them, you would understand how to make them secure again. Um, and that that's how it goes, I think. Um, so in that area, I think um, that's maybe where my research focuses on more and if, like more, more recently is that. Um, so one thing that it's, it becomes related to breaking systems is how you would learn from a quantum system. Uh, 
because imagine I have um, I have a cryptographic scheme and somehow I can embed it into a, a quantum system. You can assume that it's a um, large system, including lots of um, qubits. Um, and um, what what you want? So now now that your cryptographic system is embedded in such a such a system, in order to break it, you would have to learn uh, this this process. So you would have to try to interact with it through some input and output, mm -hmm. and then try to extract that secret parameter or try to be able to predict how it would behave, and that's how cryptanalysis becomes relevant to learning and things like machine learning and learning theory, which is the more recent focus of my research. So I'm trying to somehow formally relate these two fields together and use uh, learning algorithms in order, uh, uh, learning algorithms as a tool for cryptanalysis. I see. Thank you. No, that's really cleared up a lot for me as well, especially about cryptanalysis. And it sounds like you need a lot of creativity and curiosity to also try to break these systems. And I can completely see where learning theory comes into that. Um, so yeah. what would you say that the, the fundamental goals of your field of research are. So you've mentioned that um, we want to have secure cryptographic uh, like functions or um, protocols. And is it the hope that by understanding the fundamental nature of these quantum systems, i.e. by quantum learning, we can develop stronger security tools Yes, that, that's that's uh, correct. Um, I think one of the main goals of the field of quantum cryptography and quantum cryptanalysis is that you build a um, secure system with the help of quantum uh, devices. Mm -hmm. um, but I would argue that this is more than just about security. It's, mm -hmm. it's about reliability in the long term. Um, so if I want to break this down, mm -hmm. uh, I have to first explain that uh, a lot of modern cryptography is based on um, some assumptions. So these assumptions come from mathematics and come from the fact that some problems, we believe that they're hard to, to solve, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's usually some sort of asymmetry between that these are problems that are hard to solve, but they're easy to check somehow. Um, so a lot of modern cryptography is based on that. Um, but some of these problems, it turned out that if you have a quantum computer, they're not hard to solve anymore. Right. And that's ha that has changed a lot, the whole field of uh, cryptography, as we know, and quantum cryptography becomes really important. Um, so now there's like other sets of assumptions that we believe quantum computers cannot break. Um, but it's still the idea of how I, how I can make a crypto systems that is secure and I don't need to rely on such assumptions is also a big part of quantum um, cryptography. And that comes with the, the fact that in quantum cryptography, a lot of times you can have provable security. So you can actually prove relying on some minimal assumption and some assumptions that come from the physics itself, that your system is secure and it will remain secure, which is, I think, um, an important and interesting idea. Um, so yes, I mean, de designing such systems is, is, a big, um, is a big question of the field, but also uh, because we want to actually use these systems in practice and make it um, accessible. Um, the, it's, it's very important to, um, to design these classical systems or hybrid quantum classical systems that are efficient and are practical to use because otherwise they will only stay in the lab. So that's from the practical side of uh, 
side of it. But to me personally, I think there's one one more goal uh, to the field, and mm -hmm. that's um, that crypto uh, brings a lot of nice and interesting math with it, which we can actually use uh, to um, to understand quantum information and quantum mechanics better. So we can use crypto and all the crypto toolkits as a good um, good way to attack other problems in other areas. Um, again, like learning theory or things like that. So I think another goal of the field to me is, is something like that. Right. So essentially, so it's not just security, it's reliability and um, efficiency in the long term. But as you mentioned, it's also beautiful maths and developing new techniques and tools that we True. can apply to different situations. And so what kind of theoretical tools do you use in your field? Maybe you could discuss a few of them in a, um, on, on a high level. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so I use a lot of tools from quantum information theory, mm -hmm. um, things like entropy, um, the concept of uncertainty, and um, something we call uncertainty relation or uncertainty entropic relation. Um, so, I mean, to explain it very, very roughly, uh, it's the idea that we have uncertainty in, in quantum mechanic uh, that um, we cannot um, uh, observe some, some observables at the same time with uh, arbitrary precision. And this idea can uh, be formalized in the information theory way, and it will give you some inequalities uh, which you can use for your proofs and lots of things like that, which is actually really beautiful. Uh, so yeah, there's that uh, and other tools also in quantum information, but broadly quantum information. Um, I use a lot of tools, uh, techniques, proof techniques and tricks and everything from classical cryptography. Um, oh. um, and so a lot of also like uh, concepts in cryptography, they actually come from classical notion. And then we try to redefine them in the quantum world and see how they mean, what they mean now when we have uh, quantum parties playing these games or quantum devices that act differently. Um, but it's, it's often very important to uh, know the classical ones. Right. And so these were things that you didn't know about before you started your PhD, presumably, the cryptography yes, side. Yes, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I learned along the way these things and I found them very, uh, very exciting, very interesting. Um, yeah, as I said, to me, crypto is a, is a lot of nice math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that's what I uh, like about it. Maybe that, that's what I even more care about it than what these functionalities actually achieve at the end. <laughs> but um, it's more about yes. the journey. <laughs> yes, it's more about the journey. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that kind of leads on to the next question I had, because your work really lies between cryptography and quantum computing or quantum information theory. Um, or more broadly, computer science and physics, but very broadly. So have you found that these communities have a lot in common? Has it been challenging to combine them? And I mean, did you feel a bit overwhelmed at the start or just excited? Absolutely. When you were <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I feel these communities do have similarities, lots of similarities, but they're also very different. I think they're they're very different um, in their mindset. I I, I would say even uh, so in computer science, what I find out is that it's a lot about uh, formalizing, simplifying, clarifying the problem, and then attack it step by step, almost like a machine solving the problem. But it right. gives you a very structured, nice, beautiful way of thinking about problems and solving them and writing proofs. 
which I didn't know and I learned and I'm really gr grateful that I learned how to do that. Um, on the other hand, physics is a lot about, at least to me, is a lot about intuition. Uh, it's a lot about the big picture and it's a lot about you close your eyes and you try to imagine what's happening. <laughs> Uh, even 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 in like a small research problems. Um, so even, even when I'm thinking about unitaries and channels as a physicist, I, I close my eyes and try to understand <laughs> how it would be, behave. <laughs> and so I think it's um, so and this this difference in the mindset, I think it spreads out throughout the field and throughout all the researchers who are working on the field. And it's um, uh, it makes them very different, but also very, very interesting and very interesting and challenging at the same time to interact with each other. And I think in, in that respect, I was lucky that I got to be both. So I, yeah. I learned how to be a computer scientist and I, I was born and breathed a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. Um yeah, I think I think you touch on something really nice there, the the differences between them and how it spreads and it seems to me at least in within quantum computing you kind of have more of a an overlap. Like maybe the the intuition and the imagination of the physicists they're trying to also become a bit more um, concrete as <laughs> a computer scientist and That's vice true, versa. Yeah. Whereas in the wider fields, they might be a little more separate. I don't know. Yeah, I I think I agree. And I think that's what I like about the field. And um, I think it would be very important if we keep doing this. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and we keep talking to each other. Because for instance, maybe some of the proofs that I would write as a physicist, mm -hmm. if I read them now, I would be like, no, that's not a proof. <laughs> That's not formal. <laughs> so, so, so true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it it, it really changes you <laughs> when you when you do it properly. You would realize that. <laughs> yes. Um, so no, I think it's it's very important um, uh, that they they talk to each other, and and it's really it's really beautiful that in this field we have a space for both the species to exist <laughs> and to, to interact. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of like hopeful. And I think we got even over in this field over the years, we got better at working with each other and interacting with each other, um, both physicists and computer scientists. Yeah, I think I would agree with that as well, definitely. And hopefully it can continue that way. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so we asked this question uh, to every guest. Uh, physics has historically been a field dominated by white cisgender men, and there's still a long way to go before we reach a level playing field, so to speak. In your experience, do you think things are changing at all for the better? And, um, and perhaps this also touches a bit on the barriers for all different types of people in physics in general? Mm -hmm. I see, now that's a great question. Um, so I think I agree with the first part of it that uh, physics um, is at least very visibly <laughs> male dominated. I'd say computer science is even worse in a sense that I think physics is slightly better. You see more more diversity in physics than maybe in computer science, but that's maybe my view. I'm not sure hundred percent if I'm not if I'm right. Um, but well, so first of all, personally to me, I think um, this might maybe sound weird, but it it never seemed like a barrier so mm -hmm. it was like seeing less women in the field never stopped me to um to want that and if anything maybe it made me more serious about that i want a place in that uh, in that space and i i want to be a part of it um 
um, but I understand that um, this doesn't maybe apply to to everyone. So maybe like um, young people um, when they when they see like less people like themselves being um, uh, in the high rank positions um, in physics or computer science, they might be discouraged. But I think maybe this is the first thing that we should try to learn and maybe we should try to teach to our children or younger people that um, we we would obviously try to change that but the main change should come internally from us and this this should not stop us and um, yeah so <laughs> we, we, we should go for it no matter if there's people like us or not people like us, it's just we, we should go for it if that's something we want. And maybe like if this comes from within, then it can change uh, things for better in the larger scale. But I mean, that that's my view. Maybe I got this from from the fact that I'm coming from a country that <laughs> gave me a very thick skin <laughs> right? to, yeah. uh, to, to, you know, to injustice towards women or things like that. But um yeah so i think maybe maybe that's that's the way to to attack this problem um and i think that second part of the question is that do you think it's it's got better yeah i think uh, it's it it got much better so i think maybe the main problem is not that you see fewer women is when you see um that in some cases, uh, women are not taken seriously. Maybe that's mm -hmm. what's most discouraging and problematic. And I think in that respect, it's uh, it's getting much better. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, um, um, you see women in high uh, ranks and positions and in physics and in computer science. Um, who are respected and who do great work and a lot of people realize that they're doing great work and I think this is this is great hmm. um, it's great to see it's very encouraging and it's great to see that this is changing maybe like years ago this wasn't the case even though you had really a strong uh, record and you were very um, very distinguished in your field even even then you wouldn't take can you have been taken as seriously but I don't think that's the case now and I think it's just a good change yeah no I do see what you mean I, I, I think um, I think I can completely understand your perspective and I think that you're right that perhaps the amount of women in the field hasn't changed that much but the way that the people's researchers is research is viewed has changed. Um, I do think that when you are like the minority in any situation, you can sometimes question any reaction that people have to you and view it in terms of that. So you can, it can sometimes play with your mind a bit. And maybe yeah. that's where that's <laughs> like thick skin you talked about comes in very handy because You've, you've had to face so many different things that you're very determined just to get through your goal and say, look, I know this, I know this about myself and I'm going to do it regardless. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think, I think it's really important that um, yeah, people face this problem internally and I think mm -hmm. maybe, like, ideally when we would overcome this problem is when we um, define ourselves as scientists irrespective of gender, but mm -hmm. really irrespective of it, not not trying to, you know, like um, maybe empower one minority over the other one. Or as I think uh, it's that's not the way it should go. The way it should go is that I'm a scientist. Who cares <laughs> what gender right. do I have? Um, and that's maybe that's 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 the best practice to go towards. But but I understand that maybe in order to get there, we need to have a bit um, more representation. Yeah, yeah, have so a bit more representation. Yeah, it becomes easier to do that. But I think you're right. I think that's definitely the end goal, like where we can just talk about science without even having to have this conversation. 
that exactly <laughs> that would be incredible um okay so now for the super deep question talking about internal things uh if you could go back in time and give yourself just one piece of advice what would it be it can be a bit more than one <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, that's a good tip <laughs> one piece of advice um so the first piece of advice I would give myself is that don't take any advice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think I've um I've came a long way with just that advice of not <laughs> taking <laughs> any advice. Uh but maybe if I if I if I'm able to cheat a little bit, I would mm-hmm. say one more thing and that's um don't lose your passion. Mm-hmm. Um because I feel like when you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter even how good at it you are, you will get good at it. And it's not even about being good at something, I think. If you have passion, you're doing something that's um, probably meaningful. Mm. Uh, while as if you, if you lose your passion, you just, you'll just become a brick in the wall, even, even in science. So... I think the way to go is just, I mean, at least to me, I would say to me, I'll probably say to other people, don't lose your passion. I think that's a really good piece of advice. If you if you lose it, then try to find it again. <laughs> I agree, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so if our audience wants to learn more, where can they find you on the internet? We can put links in our website. So I'm on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. uh, but other than that, I'm not a very social media person, <laughs> publicly at least. But I recently put up a website. It's minadusti.github.io. Uh, you can Yeah, you can find about more about my research and some of the stuff there. Perfect. Thank you very much to Dr. Mina Dusti for her time today. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks also to the Unitary Fund for supporting this podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider liking, sharing and subscribing wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. It really helps get our guest stories out to as wide an audience as possible. I hope you'll join us again for our next episode. And until then, this has been Inside Quantum. I've been Dr. Ellen Darbshire, and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.